now call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome all of you that are in attendance tonight. We've got a packed house here. I know we have a few presentations and a, a couple of promotions, but it's always nice to see a lot of faces out there. Uh, I want to also welcome those that are watching the uh, uh, G10 telecast of the meeting. Uh, to begin with tonight, uh, in a few moments, we're going to have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation, but I've got some special guests here tonight. I have some Boy Scouts. I have uh, Boy Scout Troop 357 uh, from the Infant of Prague with uh, Marco Carlton, uh, who is the Scout Master, and, and Dr. Doug Lasson, who's the Assistant Scout Master. And I also have uh, Boy Scout Troop 496 from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Rob Brown is the committee chair. Uh, these young these young men are working on their citizenship and community uh, and communication badges. And I would like to ask you if you would help accommodate us tonight by coming forward and leading everyone with the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you would come up, please. And everybody, please rise. we pause to give you thanks to give you thanks for the blessings you have so graciously bestowed upon each of us today and upon our city of Jacksonville as we enter the more fully this hurricane season we pray that through your divine providence that you would shield us and our city and community from storms and from hurricanes tonight our thoughts and prayers are with those in Louisiana who are suffering through those major floods. Be with them in their time of need. We pray for our military who are here, serving us here and around the world, and for their anxious families. And as always, we ask for your guidance and direction to be with our mayor and with our council. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your, your help this evening. <clears throat> Council, before you tonight, you have a uh, copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt this agenda. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> All right, we have several presentations we're going to do tonight, and uh, I'm going to come around front and begin these presentations. This is always a very pleasurable part of the meeting. Tonight. This is for no vet left behind. <clears throat> and I would ask Mr. Reginald Roy, who's co chairman of Onslow Veteran Task Force, if he'll come forward and join me, please. In February of 2016, organizations that serve homeless veterans throughout the state were invited. <clears throat> to Raleigh to participate in the North Carolina Rapid Result Veterans Boot Camp. As part of the effort, the No Vet Left Behind campaign is being launched in the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County. And I have a proclamation that has been prepared that I will read at this time. <clears throat> Whereas the city of Jacksonville is dedicated to supporting military veterans and their families, and whereas 
Homelessness among our military veterans is a critical concern impacting the health, well-being, employment, and educational opportunities of the men and women who have proudly served our country. And whereas we recognize that local participants in the Homeless Service, homeless service Network who work through the uh, continuum of care to house homeless veterans will be the foundation by which homelessness amongst all populations will be resolved. And whereas we will continue to provide ongoing local leadership to combat homelessness among our veterans and others within the city. And whereas there are historic levels of federal resources available to aid homeless veterans and their families through collaboration with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Veterans Affairs, the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, and the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. Now, therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, the mayor of the city of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim the month of August as No Vet Left Behind Month in the city of Jacksonville, and I urge all citizens to join in supporting homeless veterans in our community. I want to present you with this proclamation. Thank you. Council members, Your Honor, I would like to just take a few moments, just one moment, just to say we are proud of what we have accomplished the first 100 days. We are currently in our second 100 days. And from talking with the heads of the agencies within the task force, we are on track not only to house 12 veterans, we just possibly may house 25 or more veterans between now and the 15th of October. So. <clears throat> I do encourage anyone that wants to come and help us, support us, even if you just want to write a line down at the meeting to keep notes. We're happy to have you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Council Member Washington to join me up front since she is the liaison to the Appearance and uh, Beautification Committee. Or, I'm sorry, old, old habits die hard. It's the Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee uh, to recognize homes and commercial sites in our community with outstanding visual appearance, outstanding recycling efforts, and personal or group service to our city that advances the spirit of being clean and green. Um, is Patrick here to Tonight. Patrick didn't make it. Okay. All right. So we're going to recognize two businesses who have been nominated by citizens as having outstanding visual appearances. First off, I would like to ask um, Mr. Alan Mondrakoffler. Are you here? Ah. Hey, we appreciate you coming. Yes, sir. This is uh, first, our first business is Buffalo Wild Wings. Thank you. Uh, at 4175 Western Boulevard. Um, on the screen, you can see some pictures of the uh, location and some of the work they've done there to beautify that site. Uh, it, is, it is gorgeous over there. Pass that on to Alan for us. And the company is also proud of their involvement in the community, and they do work closely as a good corporate citizen here in Jacksonville. Thank you for coming up and accepting this award tonight. Uh, <clears throat> Next, I would like to call up, um, you can stay up here for a minute, Kim Conrad, uh, the regional manager for uh, Marine Federal Credit Union. Hey, Kim. Uh, the well-known landmark at 4180, let's get it up there on the screen there, we have 4180 Western Boulevard has been an example of a site that's been well-maintained, a site that has demonstrated the concern the community has for its Jacksonville home. Um, Marine Federal is clearly a company that has worked with the community from fundraisers to scholarships to all kind of things that they do in this community. They do it, they work as a great uh, community citizen here, a corporate citizen, and uh, their presence is very felt in this community. I mean, Marine Federal has done uh, 
you can see a lot of pride went into the, uh, de uh, the, the development of this site. And we want to say how much we appreciate you and Jeff and everybody else down there at Marine Federal for all the great work that y'all have done to make this uh, such a nice visual in our city. Thank you very much. Next, I have some uh, citizen accommodations and life-saving awards, and I got, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Chief Tim Alfatano if you'll join me up front here, please. <clears throat> okay. Also, I have some other people I'd like to call up front here. Uh, Mr. Ben Beasley III, uh, Mr. Roy Ellis Baggett. Appreciate you guys taking the time to come out, Ellis. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> also, I'd like to call up uh, hey, Spencer. Uh, Spencer Lee as our fire chief here. Uh, telecommunicators David Bledgey and Nina Cruz. Officers Justin Hall and Heather Kale. Captain Chris Blackman from the Fire, De fire Services. Yeah. Driver Operator Scott Brown and William Stanley. And Firefighters Joshua Booth and Michael Vanderveer. Yeah. And hopefully we haven't left anybody out. So we're going to have to tighten up, huh? Okay. At approximately 1.26 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, June 9th, 2016, Mr. Ben Beasley III witnessed a co-worker being unresponsive. He immediately began to care for his co-worker. Mr. Ellis Baggett called 911. The city of Jacksonville's 911 emergency response received the call for medical assistance. Working as a team, telecommunicators David Bledgey and Nina Cruz dispatched Jacksonville Police Department, Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services Department, and notified Oslo County Emergency Services. Within one minute of receiving the 911 call, Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services Units and, Jackson, and officers from Jacksonville Police Services responded. All responders worked together seamlessly to deliver life-saving care to the patient. All responders remained on scene assisting with life-saving measures and preparing the patient for emergency transport to Oslo Memorial Hospital. The patient was transferred to Vidant Medical Center where doctors told family members that the efforts of the first responders was instrumental in saving his life. The patient's family remains hopeful for a full recovery. The quick actions of Mr. Beasley and Mr. Baggett in calling 911 and beginning CPR along with the quick response and teamwork of staff from the Jacksonville Department of Public Safety led to another life saved in the city of Jacksonville. And I'm very proud tonight to present to, there you are, Spencer, to Mr. Ben Beasley III and Mr. Ellis Baggett. Thank you, Ben. Good job, Ellis. I appreciate it. Very pleased to, to uh, present them with the Civilian Commendation Award. Um, it's folks like you that get involved. We got a person that's here today, thanks to you. Thanks to your attention. Uh, 
we're going to give some life-saving awards to telecommunicators David Bledgey, Nina Cruz, officers Justin How uh, Hall, and Heather Kale, Captain Chris Blackman, <clears throat> driver operator Scott Brown, and William Stanley, firefighters Joshua Booth, and Michael Vanderveer. Appreciate y'all working as a team. We, we still have one additional citizen here in Jacksonville due to your, uh, your stepping up and, and, and being a good neighbor and being a good, uh, just being a good human being. Thank you very much. Good job. Good teamwork there. Next, we have a presentation. This is from the North Carolina Association of Zoning Officials. Uh, this is the Zoning Official of the Year. And I would like to ask Ms. Phyllis Arp to join me up front here. The Phyllis uh, Zoning and Code Enforcement Officer here with the City of Jacksonville, she was just recently awarded the North Carolina Association of Zoning Officials uh, Zoning Official of the Year in the whole state of North Carolina for the uh, NCAZO <laughs> at their conference. That's great. We like it when our people do things so good, get things, get, get recognized. Phyllis is an extremely knowledgeable and hardworking and dedicated professional who is an integral member of the uh, zoning enforcement team here at the City of Jacksonville. Her leadership work, her work ethic, and time management skills have served her very well here. Her experience, foresight, and input regarding enforcement techniques have been instrumental in developing effective, efficient operational procedures for land use enforcement and minimum housing code compliance. Her, professional and, and her professionalism and compassion lead to the amicable resolution of issues while always staying within the letter of our ordinances and the codes that she has sworn to uphold. Phyllis exemplifies the traits of professionalism and service that her colleagues, city staff, and the North Carolina Association of, of Zoning Officials can be proud of. She is very truly deserving of this award. And Phyllis, that's a nice, that's a nice little plaque they gave you there. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Gary, did you get a good enough picture? The last thing we're going to do here, is, as far as the presentation tonight, is we got somebody that's going to get promoted. That's always a good thing. Uh, Deputy Chief Lee, uh, if you join me back up here again, uh, Tim, I guess you're part of this also with the Department of Public Safety. Well, they want to hold that. Yeah, let's see if I can hold that. I'm very proud to call up Jordan Sanquist and his family, if anybody's present with his family. Jordan is... 
is a driver operator too. But he's going to be a captain. That's what, we're going to, that's what he's been promoted to. A recent retirement created a vacancy at the Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services for a company officer. A promotional process was completed in which, obviously, you excelled above, above and beyond everybody else. And it's with a, a great deal of, uh, of pleasure that I'm able to get you up here tonight and swear you uh, to that office. <clears throat> we tell everybody a little bit about you first. It was, it's, it's a good stuff. It's good stuff. Eric Jordan Sanquist is a native of Richlands. He grew up in the Nine Mile area and graduated from Richland High School in 2005. Jordan began his fire service career at the age of 17 as a juvenile, a, a junior, not a juvenile, a junior. <laughs> I was going to say a juvenile delinquent, but I, as a junior volunteer firefighter for the Nine Mile Volunteer Rescue Squad or fire department, excuse me. That's an insult, wasn't it? Okay. Um, he continued serving his community by also joining the Nine Mile Volunteer Rescue Squad where he worked his way up to the captain there of the rescue squad. Jordan began his professional career in emergency response as a lifeguard supervisor with the Riceville Beach Fire Department Ocean Rescue while he attended Cape Fear Community College. In March of 2009, Jordan was hired as a firefighter trainee with the Jacksonville Fire Department. Since his employment with the Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services, Jordan has served as a Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2, Driver Operator 1, and Driver Operator 2. Uh, he holds an associate, degree in a, a sci associate in Science degree from the Cape Fear Community College and an Associate degree in Fire Protection Technology from Coastal Carolina Community College. He's also certified as a firefighter to driver, operator, pumps and aerials, fire instructor, fire inspector, EMT basic, fire officer two, rapid intervention team, and technical rescuer specialty certifications in ropes, vehicle machinery rescue, and water rescue. Additionally, Jordan has received an extrication award and a meritorious unit citation award. Today, today Jordan, uh, will pin on the rank of captain and Jordan's wife, Alyssa. She's in, that's a beautiful United States Air Force uniform. Will assist, <laughs> will assist another captain. We've got two captains in the family. Will assist in the presentation. At this time, I, I would be pleasured to administer the oath to you. And if you would repeat after me. <clears throat> I, Eric Jordan Sanquist. I, Eric Jordan Sanquist. Do solemnly, swear do solemnly swear that I will be alert and vigilant in performing my duties as a captain of the city of Jacksonville, fire and emergency services, fire and emergency services that I will not be influenced, that I will not be influenced in any matter on account of personal bias or prejudice that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and execute the duties of my office as a captain of the City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. According to the best of my skills, to the best of my skills and judge, skills, abilities, and judgment. Skills, abilities, and judgment. So, help me God. so help me God. Congratulations, Captain. stuck.
How about we get it started for you? Here you go. Sometimes it's better to take uh, pre cut those holes a little bit. There you go. Good job. Very good, Jordan. Very good. Get, a picture, get a picture of the two of you together there. It's always nice to be able to, to see somebody going on up in their career. It's, it's, it's really nice. We come to a point in the meeting where uh, the presentations are over, and I'm going to take a little time out here and uh, give uh, people that don't want to stay for the uh, business part of the meeting. If you want to leave now, uh, this is a great opportunity. If you want to stay, by all means, please do. But this, I'm, I'm, we're going to stop for a few seconds and give you a time to, to leave. Thank you for coming. Thanks for bringing them, Doug. from the side, that's for sure. Uh, session of public comment that's slated for the evening. 
I have no one that has signed up. Is there anyone that may have snuck in on me that wants to, to speak at public comment? By all means, please raise your hand. Okay. We're going to move along now to the adoption of our minutes. Uh, we have minutes from the August 3rd, 2016 regular workshop meeting, as well as uh, two consent items that are on the agenda tonight. And I would entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> We're going to move on to item number three. Uh, in the agenda, and this is a map amendment. I'm sorry, let's see here. It's a public hearing for a map amendment rezoning from uh, neighborhood commercial to uh, corridor commercial at the corner of Piney Green Road and Hemlock Drive. And Jeremy Smith is going to be presenting this item from our planning department. Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that is correct. I, agenda item three is a proposed rezoning at the southeast corner of Piney Green Road and Hemlock Drive. Notice the location before you on the map the, in the screen. A uh, little bit closer view. This is the aerial photography of the site. Wolf Properties has submitted this rezoning request for a 0.71 acre tract of land. Uh, the current zoning is neighborhood commercial. He is asking that the city council rezone to corridor commercial. Um, the history in this area has been rezoning to corridor commercial. The adjacent property across Hemlock Drive was rezoned a few years ago, and property across Piney Green near the Patriot Park subdivision was also rezoned to corridor commercial. The camo, future Camo Land Use map um, supports this. Uh, you'll notice in this area, um, properties are identified as mixed use, um, and the Camo Land Use supports this. At the July 11th, 2016 Planning Advisory Board, uh, they, the Planning Board reviewed this and is recommending approval along with staff. Mr. John Pierce is representing the applicant and is here along with staff, could answer any questions that the City Council may have. And with that, I, I do not have any more to add. Quick, quick question here. Is this not uh, the same subject parcel that we discussed one time before when we, where there was a uh, issue of the extension of Hemlock Drive across uh, Piney Green Road. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the time when Patriot Park, uh, the 200 lot, the initial 200 lot subdivision was proposed, there was discussion and a requirement for when future development of the larger parcel, that realignment of Hemlock Drive um, occur in some form or fashion with work with DOT. The current property owner of the larger track, uh, Martin Aragona, and the developers of Patriot Park. Um, at one time, there was a Walmart neighborhood market proposed on this project, and they were going to realign. However, that project has not moved forward. So at this time, the realignment is there's no plans for it, but if the larger parcel to the northeast develops, uh, that realignment would occur as a requirement. What, what, what does the impact with this ha would that have on this rezoning at a later date from uh, mr pierce may be able to add to this because uh, i know he's worked with the property owner mr hernandez um that this property w could actually get larger would gain property um with the realignment of the right of way she would get the road pardon if she if would the, get the road yeah the road would become road. Would be split mm. the old road there's no kind of corridor protection or anything on this. It's, it's Not that I'm aware. Okay. Council, any questions of Mr. Smith? I, I would like <coughs> to add that we did advertise in the paper. Uh, we sent our adjacent notices, put a sign on the property, and at this time, uh, and the planning and permitting has not received any um, questions, opposition, or for. Well, let's see since then if anybody's changed their mind. At this time, I'm going to recess the regular city council meeting, open a public hearing that's required in this matter. Anyone present wishes to speak, please indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Pierce. John Pierce, 405 Johnson Boulevard. I'm here to address any concerns that the mayor or the council may have. And Mayor Phillips, as you alluded to, 
I worked with these folks back in the day when neighborhood Walmart was looking at uh, possibly constructing there. Of course, they got a little behind the curve with it worked with DOT, and and as a result, the neighborhood market didn't work. And but there was a an agreement that this property wouldn't be left because it's not going to have direct access to to Piney Green Road. But there was a an agreement to get access to the reline Hemlock Lane, and this property would gain it would gain some land with the abandonment and removal of Hemlock Lane. So, but I think we are, we meet all the requirements of the proposed rezoning application request, and plus it does agree with the future land use plan, land use plan and is consistent with, with the rezonings that's occurred up and down the road. <coughs> and I'd like to try to answer any questions you may have. Council, anybody have any questions of Mr. Pierce on this matter? Right, thank, thank you. you John. Anybody else? At this time, I'll close the public hearing in this matter, reconvene the council meeting. Uh, yes, Mayor Phillips, I'd like to make the motion to approve the rezoning request based on findings of facts A through J being found in the affirmative and the rezoning advances the public interest by creating more development opportunities and making the property consistent with the future land use map. Second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Next, we have agenda item number four. This is a public hearing on the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment for Reasonable Accommodation in Accordance with the Federal Fair Housing Act, uh, Article 2 Administration, and it lists uh, three different articles. Uh, Ryan King, our Planning Administrator and Permitting Administrator, will be presenting this item. Ryan. Good evening, Mayor Council. The item before you tonight, four and five, both stem from a recent uh, board of Adjustment case that we had pertaining to an Oxford house that established in the Jackson City limits. And based on that zoning enforcement action that occurred, um, city planning staff discussed with the city manager, city attorney, and outside specialized legal counsel on some deficiencies that our ordinance had within it. And we then created standards for reasonable accommodations and we, we basically put that in an internal policy on how to deal with zoning issues where we needed to be able to have an avenue to deal with them where there was protections under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And based on that, we now realize that we want to have that codified and put into the Unified Development Ordinance so that anybody that wants to know about, you know, what provisions they have, which processes they need to go through, we want to have that added to the city's unified development ordinance. So this request is simply going to add standards in which one goes through to obtain a reasonable accommodation when they are protected under that FFHA. So within the attachment tonight, you can see that they're adding or we're adding language to articles two of the unified development ordinance, which basically identifies who makes the decision and basically what the procedures are. And with that, be happy to answer any questions that city council may have as it relates to this request at this time. Thank you, council. Any questions of Mr. King? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. At this time, we'll recess the regular council meeting and open the public hearing in this matter. Does anyone present wishes to speak in regards to this matter? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing, reconvene the city council meeting. Council, you've been asked to uh, consider the zoning text amendment. Mayor Phillips, I move that we approve the zoning text amendment as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Brings us to agenda item number five for the evening. <clears throat> this is a public hearing on a unified development ordinance text amendment creating Oxford House homes and associated standards. Um, and Ryan King, our planning and permitting administrator, will be presenting this item. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Council, again, this second agenda item, or the fifth agenda item tonight, is a second unified development ordinance amendment. And this is to establish a new land use within our Article 4 which identifies what allowable and special and prohibited uses are within the city of Jacksonville. In this specific request, we're going to create a new definition for an Oxford house and establish what zoning districts they can go in 
and certain limiting, um, we call them specific use standards. And basically what that is, spacing requirements, parking requirements specific to Oxford houses. At the same time, we are proposing to relocate similar uses which we refer to as family care homes and group homes that are listed under accessory use standards. They need to be moved to our, our use table because there were some contradictions between the two sections currently. So we're gonna clean that up. So there's kind of two parts to this agenda item. So as you can see within the proposal, and I've got it here uh, on the screen, we're going to create new uses. Here are the requirements that would go with that. The Oxford House or similar homes, they would have to meet a thousand foot spacing requirement from other similar homes or family care homes or group homes. They have to have sufficient area to um, hold four parking spaces, and that's not literally parking spaces, that's just room to fit them within a driveway. Oh, we're gonna limit the, the number of pets. No exterior signage as they will be in a residential zones. Uh, inspectors have the right to enter the pro property and inspect. And basically, if they cannot meet any of these standards, they would have to follow the reasonable accommodation request <clears throat> that you just put into the Unified Development Ordinance with the previous amendment. This is a excerpt of the Unified Development Ordinance. You can see here, this is the cleanup within the use table for group homes and family care homes and also adding Oxford homes within the ordinance. So as you can see here, Oxford homes will be permitted within the residential districts. You can see the, the primary residential districts here, the 40, 20, 10, and 7. We are not proposing to allow them in the residential multifamily low density or the RS5, but they would be allowed within the RMF HD zone, not with any commercial. As stated before, an Oxford house is a type of home. We would then relocate the 4.3 accessory use standards. They would be moved to Article 4.2, just for clarity. And the definition of an Oxford house, as you can see here on the bottom of the screen, as council may have been wondering, what is an Oxford home or similar home? It's a self-run, self-supported recovery home for recovering alcoholics or drug addicts chartered by Oxford House Incorporated and governed by the bylaws of that corporation. Or a home that is substantially similar to the Oxford House model and which home has not more than eight residents. An Oxford House model shall not include persons being housed in correctional facilities or mental Ill, mentally ill persons who are dangerous to others as defined in the North Carolina General Statutes. As I stated previously, these amendments have all basically been studied and looked at by staff, management, the attorney, and outside legal counsel based on the case that we've had over the past few months. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. And I don't know, John, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to say a couple of things. Number one, uh, this process of the Oxford House that we've dealt with on Winthrop Way has been going on for well over a year now. And a lot of credit needs to go to a lot of people. One would be to our outside counsel, Nick Herman from Chapel Hill, who gave us and helped educate us as to what the federal law was in this area. So we could bring our code, or at least propose to you tonight, to bring our code into compliance with that law. It also goes out to these residents who live in that neighborhood. Uh, there's been one lady who's been the contact person that I've kept in contact with and sort of let her know that tonight would be a public hearing. As well as you saw, I think it was Monday, there was a front page article on this hearing that was going to happen tonight. I've dealt with one phone call for about 30 minutes. But the neighbors uh, have come to a realization that the federal courts recognize this type of a home, when they meet this definition, that it is given uh, acceptance as a single family residence and that we have to, according to the, the federal courts and the legislature, accommodate it. But I think credit also has to go to Oxford House because when I talk to the, uh, the lady who's my contact and even with the lady who called me uh, it, yesterday and was not happy, but she understood there's not a lot that we can change about federal law at the local level. But uh, again, the Oxford House residents uh, as the manager said to, in the paper, you know, there's not been any instances or anything over there. Uh, the, the model must work. 
when they work at it and, and knowing that they've got to, number one, stay clean, that they've got to self-govern themselves, or they just don't stay there. But again, that model has worked, and we hope that it will continue. As I told the lady yesterday, I said, ma'am, if it doesn't, you just call the police or you call uh, code enforcement or whatever you think needs to be done, and we'll be right on top of it because they are not they're still held to the same law as any single family would be as you know, as far as the appearance of their home, as far as the uh, activities at their home and so forth. But again, uh, lawyers like time because time kind of takes care of a lot of things. And in this case, I think time has helped all of us come to a better understanding of Oxford homes and about where we uh, have to accept them in our communities. And again, there's a societal purpose that the folks who have had and still struggle with alcoholism or drug addiction, that there is a way for them to have reinforcement from their peers and to hopefully to, to go into these homes for six months or maybe longer, whatever their program calls for, and to uh, help them to begin to move uh, so that they're not, uh, again, thrown back into a situation where they came from, where there's nothing but drugs hitting them from every direction. It is an opportunity, and again, this particular home has been a success story for the last year. We just hope it continues to be that way. Thank you. John, I have a question in regards to the inspection that, that Ryan talked about. What, what exactly did, did you mean by our inspectors can go? Is that... No. I didn't think that that could No, happen. No, it's just if, if they don't keep the yards... Oh, like normal. That normal code, normal, they okay. have, yeah, code okay. issues. Uh, you know, if you've got <coughs> four or five unrelated... Specs, Regular code enforcement. The code enforcement as, will as, be as looking at them like they do every other resident. Right. And they no, no in-home inspections or anything like that. It does say it under this... With uh, consent. Uh, it also says with consent of the consent owner. It's kind of... Okay, with consent. Kind of contradiction in there. Anyway, any other questions, Ryan? Okay, thank you. This time I'll recess the regular council meeting and open the required public hearing in this matter. Is anyone present wishes to speak regarding this? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, recommend the council meeting. Regular council meeting, you're being asked to consider the zoning text amendment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Go ahead. Mayor Phillips, I move that the uh, text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other comments or discussion? Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. Mr. Carter was very complimentary about the work of the staff and the other legal counsel in the manager's office. I think he also omitted one person that was himself who helped guide this thing to a reasonable conclusion and a resulting amendment to because if you recall, when this was first brought to our attention almost a year ago, it was fraught with the possibility of a lot of controversy. And I think level, level thinking, level-headed thinking, and so forth brought it to the kind of conclusion we find favor with today. And I compliment John for his help in leading that way. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Any other <coughs> discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to our first section of, re well, I'm sorry, it doesn't do that. It brings us to our reports for the night. And I'm going to start with Mr. Bittner, since his voice is already warmed up. <laughs> I'll just re uh, rehash what the Daily News has already reported, that is Representative Alon Wassa that they, we were provided with news of Mr. Farmer's decision to retire after being executive director for Awasa four or five years, in which time he has done a very commendable job and well he should do, having been trained in the city of Jacksonville's water and sewer uh, activities. <coughs> there won't be much, uh, there won't be any missing of any beats in terms of the operation as Mr. Farmer retires. Uh, Mr. Hudson, the present city man yeah. county manager, will be assuming that position as of around December 2nd, and Mr. Farmer will serve with him in a transition period and take over the full range January 1st or some dates around there. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Mr. Bittner. Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. No report, Mayor. Thank you. 
Washington. Yes, I would like to just share with the public and the council, um, and you, Mayor Phillips, I had an opportunity to represent the city of Jacksonville at the National League of Cities 2016 Summer Board and Leadership Meeting that was held in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, just to give um, everyone an update, um, the National League of Cities decided at their Board of Directors meeting that in spite of the controversy with um, H-Bill 2 for the state of North Carolina, that the 2017 City Summit will be held in Charlotte, North Carolina next year. This was also known as our Fall Conference. So next year, the City Summit will be held in um, Charlotte. And the Board of Directors for NLC basically decided that they were going to support Charlotte in their endeavors in spite of currently what's happening with um, H-Bill 2. Also, um, with the Human Development um, Division, the, um, the committee passed resolution with the Center of Disease Control and Prevention to further investigate and to send resolution um, and action to Congress to take more of a proactive stand in terms of reducing gun violence within our communities. Also, CDC basically um, gave us an update about the Zika virus, and currently the CDC is proposing $600 million um, from Congress to basically um, to be implemented throughout the United States for various different states in order to combat the Zika virus and the, um, the effects that it's having on preg pregnant women and their unborn children. In addition, um, we had a task force update um, from our drug czar basically to, um, to begin to look at implementations within our various different cities as we begin to um, tackle the opiate addiction. Um, Congress um, is proposing legislation for an additional $500 million to be um, released um, through the various different states um, to help to combat the opiate addiction and to offer therapy and inpatient um, treatment for those that find themselves as caught up in this vicious cycle. In addition, um, there was legislative update, and Dr. Woodruff has already alluded to this with the Department of Labor in regards with their regulation of overtime, that with certain um, individuals, they can now um, be able to um, qualify for overtime. And so that new legislation law is going to take place December 1st, 2016. The real um, initiative, um, race, um, equity, and leadership, <clears throat> basically continue to work with um, the various um, municipal leaders to help to combat um, racial inequalities um, that are currently going on in our cities. And the Human Development Committee also adopted the 13th Amendment Freedom Holiday Resolution, and that will be coming up for our adoption and approval at the City Summit meeting um, in November in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Uh, I'm just glad Bob Warden's here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Warden. <laughs> I'm always proud to be a member of this community. Love living in Jacksonville. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for your words. Uh, I have no report, Ron. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, just one item. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of summer, and it's going to be Labor Day here shortly. So uh, this is our last meeting before Labor Day, and I want to remind our large citizens that September 5th is a holiday, so it'll affect trash collection that week, the week of 5 through 9 September. Monday collection will occur on Tuesday. Tuesday's collection will occur on Wednesday. There'll be no yard waste, no, no change to those residents that have their garbage collected on Thursday and Friday. And again, Mayor and Council, thank you for your service to the citizens of Jacksonville. Colonel? No report. Thank okay. you. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. You got it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Yeah, I'm opposed. <laughs> I want to have discussion.